You're listening to Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. This is your seat at the table. Hey, everybody. Roland Frazier here. Welcome to this episode of Business Lunch. Today, we have my good friend, Oliver Schmalholz. And Oliver, you are, um, I was going to, when we were talking earlier, I was asking Oliver, I said, well, what company should I say? And then I was like, well, you got too many companies. So I'm just going to let you talk a little bit about what you're doing now, you've got some cool projects, uh, one or two that we're working on together and a bunch of other ones that, uh, that I don't even have any idea probably about. So um, welcome to the show, Oliver. Would you tell us a little bit about you and, uh, and let's start. Thanks a lot for having me, Roland. Um, excited to be here. So I'm Oliver Schmalholz, originally from Germany and- uh, Currently in Mexico. Uh, now in the US. <laughs> Currently in Mexico, yeah, I've been traveling full time, but had a little, you know, five months uh, pass to that, but now trying to resume it uh, slowly. And uh, yeah, been uh, an entrepreneur for over 20 years um, and been jumping between a couple uh, industries. So part of me being a synthetist, uh, I don't like to get um, too detailed. Uh, in a single uh, single industry, really uh, keep it to a couple of core themes that I have found to work uh, extremely well uh, in the past, and then apply that in different uh, businesses. So some of the things you've got right now, you have a news-related thing, right? Uh, yeah, so that's an analytics uh, company uh, that came uh, after uh, running an investment partnership uh, for a number of years having developed a news algorithm, uh, essentially a black box uh, that uh, automatically makes uh, trading uh, decisions. Very it was cool. interesting how I got into that. Uh, it was out of frustration uh, dealing with my stockbroker. Uh, I figured I could do better than this right, uh, right. in an automated uh, fashion. So a couple of my old uh, telecom partners and I, so that was the first big industry I was in after we uh, had a couple nice exits. Uh, we had a bunch of cash uh, there sitting around and uh, I was dissatisfied with the long-term buy and hold in the uh, uh, stock markets. And we developed a process to uh, leverage data, essentially take news and analyze it faster than a human being and then uh, turn it into a buy or sell uh, decision. And we scaled it, yeah, we scaled it to uh, almost two billion a year in transactions uh, uh -huh. with a portfolio turnover every you know one two uh, two days, uh, so pretty short uh, hold times, uh, capturing that alpha. But we kind of maxed it out from a position size and what we could do with our capital. So it was either uh, becoming licensed and starting our own hedge fund uh, or getting into a data play. Very and cool. when I looked at the Dodd-Frank Act, um, all the regulations and hiring a compliance officer and putting all those safeguards in place, uh, that uh, looked pretty bureaucratic to me. So the other monetization, making a data play out of it, um, looked like it's the better uh, path. And Very cool. that's what I did. Yep. Nice. And, and then... then uh now your latest thing is unicorn. You want to talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's super exciting. Uh, so that's uh, the deal Roland and I are working on, and mm -hmm. uh, that is combining uh, the power of affiliate marketing uh, and turning that into uh, equity deals. So for a company, a product owner that has a recurring subscription product, um, it's a alternative uh, funding source. So instead of going out uh, to raise venture capital, uh, you're able to uh, bring some of the best marketers uh, in the world on board that you could otherwise never afford. Uh, and they're going to promote uh, the product or service to their list uh, in exchange uh, for cash uh, and equity. Um, That's awesome. So it's a pretty exciting concept and nobody's ever done it before. So, so now in, in that, um, walk, walk me through an example. So let's say that I am a company and I've got uh, a product that's a uh, hundred dollars a month. So $1,200 a year. 
uh, let's say it's let's say it's a thousand dollars a year for an annual subscription, a hundred dollars a month. And um, now I I want to get people coming in. I want to get customers. And so I've uh, I don't have any affiliates now. Is that something that I would come to this program and and look for for those people to help me get customers? Yeah. So. Um... Not just affiliates, but all kinds of uh, promoters uh, that could be influencers on uh, social media, mm -hmm. uh, bloggers, uh, YouTubers, uh, anybody uh, with an audience uh, that is a match uh, for your uh, product. And, and, and so then, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and, and typically, uh, sure. Uh, typically, you know, it's pretty hard to get the big movers and shakers unless you have relationships with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty selective if, if uh, at all they ever promote any third party uh, products and services, you've got to have relationships and uh, it's a long path, uh, you know, getting them to promote your product uh, if you're new to the game. So it provides a way to access people that you might not otherwise be able to access then, correct? The, you're, you'll be able to access the best marketers in the world that otherwise, you know, you would never reach and they're able, you know, to share your product with their audiences uh, as part of the unicorn uh, platform. And then uh, it w if I do that, one of the options would be that it doesn't cost me cash. So like normally if I'm in a 20, 30, 50% or more affiliate relationship, I'm only seeing about half of the sales, you know, the dollars of sale that come in, then I've got my cost of goods sold that come out. And that, that can leave me with a pretty narrow margin, even though I'm getting customers and I'm growing. So this also, it sounds like could provide, if I've got the product that could provide me with a means of having better cash flow uh, as well. Is that, does that make sense? Uh, totally, because uh, the equity piece, uh, obviously, you're not paying out the cash piece. Um, that is long-term uh, compensation. So uh, it's optimizing uh, your uh, cash flow. And the other thing the equity piece uh, does, uh, it opens the door to those world-class marketers uh, that would never just promote it on a, a cash basis only. Um, no matter if it's, you know, 40, 50 percent or even more, um, they're just not interested in uh, short term uh, compensation. Uh, they're interested in long term uh, valve. And that's what it's this model is really about, uh, you know, turning a you know, marketer, an affiliate, uh, a blogger uh, into a uh, venture capitalist, uh, being able to build their own portfolio companies and uh, have a number of companies in a portfolio that they're building uh, wealth in. That's great. And, and so um, let's run, run through my example. How, how am I going to determine, let's say that um, that company, I, I have that company that's got the product, it's hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a year. I sign up on the platform and I want to have, um, I, I want to get affiliates. How, how do I determine how much equity I have to give away and all of that sort of stuff. Is that something the platform helps with in some way? It just sounds like it's just a little confusing for me. Right. So the starting point uh, is a valuation. What is your business currently uh, worth? Okay. And there's industry comps, how, you know, right. subscriptions as businesses uh, are valued. And that's uh, the same approach Unicorn is uh, taking here, mm -hmm. uh, taking standard industry comps, uh, and growth rate and uh, churn uh, uh, goes into the formula. Okay. And then uh, we come up with a valuation uh, that works uh, you know, for you and works for uh, Unicorn. And then we agree, for example, you know, for 20% in equity, we're going to you know, triple your business in 18 uh, months. So there's a clear revenue number associated with that, what Unicorn is able, uh, is going to deliver uh, and that's risk free. Mm -hmm. So if Unicorn never delivers it, uh, you, you're not out uh, the equity. So that's only if you physically, you know, got the MRR uh, that was agreed upon uh, in the term sheet and then in the uh, transaction uh, paperwork. So back to that transaction. So let's say uh, there's 20% allocated in total um, you know, equity for all the unicorn uh, promoters. 
then the unicorn promoters will go out and promote the product and service. And each of them has the ability uh, to select how much in cash and how much in equity uh, they want. Okay. Um, so uh, if somebody wants 100% in equity, you know, that's possible. If you want to do an 80-20 uh, or 60-40, you just move the slider over uh, and you get paid exactly uh, the way uh, you want. Okay. And, cool. and the platform does all the accounting because it gets uh, quite complicated with cap tables and, uh, you know, cash commissions and matching that all uh, up. So it has an analytics engine uh, that does all the accounting for the um, product owner um, and um, makes it accessible uh, to the promoters, to the affiliates and influencers and uh, bloggers. That's really cool. So, and when is the, when is the program launching? When is it going to get its first uh, sight of daylight? <laughs> So we currently have the early registration uh, open uh, and we're talking to a number of um, product owners that are a, a good fit uh, while the rest of the platform uh, is still uh, coded up. So we're currently working on the whole analytical uh, engine uh, to display all the data uh, properly and uh, have all the tracking with all the third party uh, platforms. So once uh, all of that is done, uh, we will start doing the first uh, couple uh, deals. Uh, okay. So yeah, by the time and this podcast uh, comes out, we might already be doing the first deal. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. So, um, so let's go into the software a little bit because I think a lot of people are intimidated about creating apps and SaaSs and things like that, but it's incredibly lucrative based on the valuations and the, the services. And, and even though there's thousands and thousands of apps uh, and, and marketing technology and FinTech and all those other things out there, they're very, very uh, saleable, very scalable, uh, very friendly valuations. So for people that are listening or watching that have not yet gone into the world of software development, but are interested in it. Um, you've got a tremendous amount of experience in it over the years. And uh, I'd love to hear your insights on if, if you didn't have anything but an idea right now, what would you do to get started in software? That, that's a great question. So it all comes with experience. Uh, once you understand the full life cycle of software yeah. development, uh, you're able to do an MVP, a minimum viable uh, product, uh, pretty much within 90 to 120 days on any new product or uh, service you wanna uh, roll out. Now, if you don't have that experience, I know people, you know, that have taken a year and a half or two and they still don't have a product. Uh, they're still right. struggling and they think they can hire a couple of up workers uh, and, uh, you know, have them piece together uh, a solution on uh, WordPress. Well, that's not a scalable uh, SaaS uh, solution. So if I had to do it all over again and uh, start completely from scratch and uh, I would probably go to somebody with an audience that doesn't have a SaaS uh, solution yet, doesn't have a recurring uh, product yet. And I would approach them and say, hey, let's partner. Okay. Uh, I'm going to build a, um, a team that will create this um, uh, software solution. And you're going to take one-time revenues and turn that into a um, recurring uh, model uh, with your audience, which gets a much higher valuation than, you know, single products. I mean, you've done it uh, with multiple of your uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. And then it always starts, uh, you know, with the uh, specifications and the design. The more time you spend up front thinking about uh, the end picture, the less you're going to spend on uh, development uh, once you start uh, coding. Okay. And that's probably the biggest mistake people make is they spend too little time uh, starting to code right away, hiring a programmer and get started without really uh, thinking it through. 
Um, so, so if tell me this, um, because a lot of people do advocate, and I've seen courses on so, you know how to make a software pro product and things like that that do advocate going out to an Upwork or some you know rent a coder or whatever. Um, what what's the downside to that? Like why why do you because you mentioned it as a mistake? What why is that a mistake? Well, if you go too quick and if you don't know what your end picture is, you're the, the first person you should really hire if you have never done product development. And again, this can be an app worker on a part-time basis for a couple hours here and there. The first person you need is a really good product manager that understands uh, asking all the right questions uh, to come up uh, with the high level specifications and then actual uh, user stories. And it, is, Once, is that different from a project manager? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so a product manager is visionary uh, and makes uh, sure you deliver these great features and is an advocate of the customer. Okay. Versus the project manager then comes in once you have defined all of that, uh, your vision and what do you want to create, the project manager is the one that takes the specifications and turns it into an actual product. Okay. Uh, but uh, they're more dealing with uh, developers and uh, defects and processes. So that's internal stuff uh, okay. and not visionary. Okay. And very few, so either you have a visionary or you have a transactional uh, project manager that's uh, task-based. Over the years, I have found very, very few of my team members in that role that understand both. Uh, a couple months ago, I hired a great um, product slash project manager uh, that understands both. Uh, she's okay. terrific. She has uh, worked in fintech uh, with products with 2 million users. And uh, so, uh, if your starting point is the product manager, then get a few hours and get some user stories, do some user interviews. And then once you have the specifications, then you can move to a project manager. Okay. Now, and so then now you know. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> and, and, and then you know, Roland, uh, yeah. Um, then you know what to build and then you know how to scope it, uh, what kind of talent uh, do you need? And then you can go on Upwork and uh, hire front end and back end uh, developers. Now, there's something called full stack developers that can do both front end and back end. And what do you I, prefer? In, in my experience, well, in my experience, I have seen the best success uh, hiring really, really good back end developers uh, and really, really good front end developers and dividing it into uh, two and uh, pieces. What is the difference? Is one like UI, you know, user interface type stuff, and one is the, the processing on the behind the scenes? Right, right. So front end is uh, what you can see uh, on the web or on a mobile app, uh, what is touchable, anything you interact with uh, in the user interface. And then the back end is the part that uh, interacts with the database. Uh, and if you build that right, it can be very, very scalable if you put it on the right infrastructure. Or if you build it wrong, you might have long load times. And if uh, you put on a lot of users, you might have a problem uh, scaling the business. And the part I left out is the UI design part, which you uh, just addressed. Mm -hmm. That typically comes before you start coding. If you have a really, really good designer and a uh, few of the best designers I've ever worked with, uh, I found on AppWork. Uh, so there's great talent. Okay. And uh, then they typically put it in a you know mock-up um, application like uh, Zeppelin, where you can see how it looks and already click on a few things. And then once you're happy with that, then it moves into a development. Okay. So I've heard product manager, project manager, UI designer, front-end developer, back-end developer. Is that kind of the team? Uh, right, uh, but then you also need a QA tester uh, on top of it because you don't okay. want developers uh, do uh, the testing. Uh, and if you got all those pieces working and then you need a really good project management uh, software and Chira uh, is the uh, leader in that uh, space uh, and then you can track everything uh, accordingly and then you're able to 
you know, do like an agile process where you move in two week uh, sprints and you don't want to get too involved, let your project manager uh, run with it. And that's really the taking, you know, a step back uh, as the entrepreneur or business owner and letting the team just develop and then looking at the end uh, result. So what would you say is the best way to, to build that team as far as do you hire that product designer first and then ask for recommendations for them? Or what, what would the process be that you would go through to build this team of, of six people, it sounds like now? <laughs> uh, yeah, Upwork is a great starting point. Uh, I always ask for uh, referrals. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is a great recruiting uh, tool, uh, especially, uh, I mean, with the uh, costs have developed onshore in the U.S., you have to, uh, you know, go uh, offshore, at least for parts of it. Right. Uh, so I run a hybrid uh, model. Uh, parts of the development team is here in the U.S. Uh, parts of it is in uh, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had uh, great success um, with that part of the world. Uh, number one, the time zone works really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the business understanding, while there's very, very talented developers in India, I have found them struggling with sp uh, business specifications in the past when I tried it a, a couple times. And I don't have that in Eastern uh, Europe. And um, uh, so LinkedIn is a great tool, you know, uh, to pretty much find people uh, anywhere in the world. If you look at a couple, you know, similar companies in that space, uh, uh, it's great. You know, if, if, if you have a part-time recruiter, which you can find e easily on uh, Upwork as well, somebody that knows how to reach out to people. If you don't like to do it yourself, uh, you're able to Find people, you know, with the same uh, tech stack experience. So you will have to make a decision: what kind of programming language do I want to pro program this in, and then uh, hire your team uh, according that. Right. And uh, then there's a couple, you know, paid, uh, uh, you know, recruiting uh, platforms. So uh, I let my wife uh, handle uh, re the recruiting. She's really good at it. And then we got a series of, uh, you know, interviewers until it makes it uh, to me and then I'll make the final uh, decision. That makes sense. So um, the last thing I'll, I'll ask you about that uh, is in budgeting, how, how do you, how did, so somebody that's getting started, how would they figure out the budget? And I know that's a big, big question because of course it depends on the project, but is there a, a method or a formula for kind of figuring out roughly what a project might cost? So if you're an inexperienced uh, entrepreneur when it comes to software development and you're doing it the first time, uh, costs can completely get out of control. I've seen people spend a million and a half to $2 million before the product is ever uh, ready. Yep. If you do the right process and you're building your MVP uh, in, uh, three to four months, uh, you're able to crank out a product for 75 to 100 uh, uh, grand uh, with that uh, team size. Uh, and that's sufficient to go into the market, collect feedback, and then, you know, keep building uh, uh, on the MVP. Okay. The, and then the mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make. Go ahead. The mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make uh, is uh, they put too many features into the MVP. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why, uh, you know, the time gets uh, longer and longer and longer. So if you narrow it down to, you know, what's really required, the one or two uh, center, uh, you know, features uh, that really make a difference focus on that. It doesn't have to look super pretty. Yes, user interface is important, but don't spend three months, uh, you know, making stuff look uh, pretty. Uh, get it out, put it in front of users, collect feedback, and then it'll be, uh, you know, paid users give you such a different feedback from uh, unpaid when you go through the, you know, initial interview uh, questions. Yeah. Um, so, 
so saving a lot of time getting your MVP out to actual users, asking for the credit cards, uh, that's super uh, important uh, to get it out quick. Nice, very cool. Um, so tell me for those people who might like to get a hold of you to find out more about all of the cool things that you're doing, including the Unicorn Project that we're doing, what is the best way for them to connect with you? Uh, sure. Uh, so we can go, uh, so they can go on Facebook, Oliver Schmalholtz, uh, that's S-C-H-M-A-L-H-O-L-Z. They can shoot me an email at oliver at unicornequity.io uh, uh, um, or register for the early uh, access at unicornequity.io. And I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, so I'm sure the audience can find me. That's awesome. And uh, we were talking since you are an avid traveler about some travel hacks before we sign off. Why don't you share a few of your favorite, maybe your top three travel hacks that you're uh, that you've discovered you think would be helpful to folks listening? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I haven't paid for a international uh, first class or business class ticket in 20 years. And, and some years we've taken three or four trips, others uh, just two, and that's, uh, you know, for the whole uh, family. Getting into the mileage uh, game, just putting all the company expenses on uh, whatever uh, best bonus credit card, getting all the sign-up bonuses. I mean, it's getting a little tougher, but a few years ago, for example, um, uh, Citibank had some American Airlines uh, elite MasterCard. Mm -hmm. My wife and I, uh, between the two of us, we got a million American Airlines uh, points out of that card. I think we got it 10 times until cities finally said enough is enough. You got <laughs> enough of those uh, cards. Really? That's so funny. credit card sign up. <laughs> and from the second card, they kept asking you, what do you need another one for? Well, I got another business that I like to keep my expenses uh, separate on. Okay, here's another card. Nice. Uh, so, so that's a great way, you know, to travel for free is uh, just those credit card sign-up offers and just putting all the expenses on. Love then, hotel-wise, arbitrage. I love to do arbitrage, uh, pay for cash uh, when rates are low, and then redeem the points when you can get four or five uh, or more cents per point uh, uh, on redemptions. Right. Um, so that's an awesome way. And then, you know, getting those big suites in the hotels. It's, uh, to me, it's all about relationships, uh, you know, building a relationship with the GM, especially if I'm returning to uh, a destination. Uh, if you got their email address or even cell phone number, uh, they can do a lot of things uh, if they like you and you treat their staff nicely. And that's probably the number one thing I learned when I talked to a corporate trainer at one of the big uh, hotel chains, I said, so what, what is it really a hotel uh, wants uh, from a you know, frequent uh, a guest? Is it you know, that you're a good tipper or you leave good reviews? And she said, no, it's uh, treating uh, everybody uh, on the staff nicely. Uh, that makes all the difference. Uh, and if so you're a pleasant you guest. That, how do you make that connection with the, um, with the, the hotels, the key people at the hotel? Oh, I always, uh, you know, engage in conversations with every, it, it, they're pretty easy to spot at, uh, the good GMs, you know, do their walkthroughs in the morning and I'll, uh, you know, just approach them if they're not proactive. I mean, a lot of times I already have their, uh, you know, they uh, reach out to me uh, pre-arrival, either through text message or an email. But if yeah. they don't do that, uh, they're pretty easy to spot, uh, especially in the mornings when they do their uh, morning walkthroughs and, I'll just get up. Uh, hey, I'm Oliver Schmalholt, and they introduced themselves, and here's my card, and we've gotten some great uh, uh, benefits out of that. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, Oliver, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show today, and I'm very excited about the Unicorn uh, Equity.io project and all the other fun stuff that you're doing. So just want to say thanks, and uh, I'll look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thanks a lot for having me, Roland. Thanks so much. Wow.